thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Allie and I am an occupational therapy student and um, along with Matt and Charlie um, helped uh, facilitate the ELP program uh, over the summer and prior to the conference. Um, and we're just gonna get started with the panel discussion focused on the weekly curriculum. So pairs were provided with a list of topics for each week uh, to kind of facilitate discussion. And of course, their conversations went way above and beyond the prompts that we provided them with. Um, but they're here to discuss their discussions, essentially. Um, and this is, you know, we want this to be a really informative experience. Um, we think this is a great model moving forward to begin to teach empathy and um, lived experience in um, for medical students and patients and caregivers. Um, so if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to raise your hand and ask. Um, and we will start with just kind of a basic question to get the ball rolling. Yeah, great. So just to kind of tail off of Ali's, um, uh, what Ali said, um, just really briefly, um, kind of the goal of this program was to really, the big picture goal was to really start facilitating uh, two-way directional learning between future healthcare providers and uh, f future interdisciplinary healthcare providers um, and patients, really in the sense that what we wanted to do is create a foundation of knowledge that allowed um, teams to really start answering answering um, healthcare design problems with tangible solutions. So the idea is really that it's very difficult to start co-creating a solution unless you really truly understand what it's like to be on the other side. Um, and that's and that's kind of what we're hopefully here to discuss. So I'd love. Um, to hear from the panel, um, you know what? What would you like to share with the audience about this program? What was the most impactful or surprising moments? Um, how did you start out? What were some of the fears you had? What were some of the misconceptions that you worried that people might, that your partner might have about you? Um, and how did those things kind of play out during the eight weeks that you spent together um, discussing wide-ranging topics um, online? Um, so we can start here. And um, we'll just take a seat over there. What you do? Okay. Do you want to go first? Yeah, because we first. have the microphone. Mm -hmm. I know, although I do feel like I spoke this morning already, so I wanted to give give somebody else the opportunity. Do you want to start there? Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Tom Wilson. I'm a third-year pharmacy student from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I go to Lipscomb University's College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, and my partner was Jasmine Sturr, and I'll let her tell you a little bit about herself. But just quickly, talking about this program, it was, it was phenomenal. I mean, we got to have an experience that you don't typically get to see, especially as a student. So I got to talk to Jasmine about herself, about um, the, the struggles that she's going through, and I got to learn from her, and I'm going to be able to go back to school and apply a lot of this stuff to not only my education, but also my practice or whatever I end up doing um, once I graduate. So uh, the, the, biggest, the biggest fear, just going off of the question, the biggest fear and uh, uh, the fear of, of uh, misrepresentation was that pharmacists pharmacists are usually thought of as someone behind the counter, counting by fives. You know, they tell you, uh, "Have you taken this before?" Okay, thank you. And and I I, uh, I really want to dispel that and and say, yeah, pharmacists can do that. Pharmacists can work at a hospital, but. Pharmacists can also do digital health. Pharmacists can also do a whole lot more. And um, it's exciting to see Jasmine already realized that. So there wasn't anything that I needed to dispel there. But uh, that, was, that was the biggest fear that I had, was, was going into it. And um, I, was, I was afraid that my role wouldn't have been appreciated as much if I was, say, a, a medical student. But um, that, that totally was unfounded. And, uh, and I'm really happy to say that that, that, that was the case. So. Um, yeah, I'll follow that up. So I'm Jasmine Thomas, my partner. Um, yeah, actually, it was kind of funny, that question of, um, you know, like, what, what's your biggest fear? And it's kind of like, we had sort of talked about pharmacy. I was like, pharmacists have saved my life a couple times when my doctors write me scripts that are, you know, um, counteract with each other. So I already had, the, like, appreciation um, for that job. Um, and I think my biggest fear 
was that my experiences as a patient would be devalued. Um, I, I am also a scientist by training, um, and I think that sometimes when I go into healthcare situations, I have to sort of like use that as a justification for things I do. Like, no, I really do understand this because I have a degree in chemistry. And it's like that sometimes I think shouldn't be what makes me being an innovative patient okay. What should make me being an innovation, innovative patient okay is that I've spent the past almost nine years living with juveniles at Parkinson's disease, um, and I'm still here and still going. Um, and that's what I think being able to share, um, and also just being able to share the life of a chronically ill person. Um, when Tom and I were Skyping, I got to, you know, be like, okay, I'm gonna like mix up my medication right now. And he got to see the whole process of me having to grind up medication and push it through my feeding tube. I had asked my professor um, if I could hug my patients. And they were like, no, absolutely not. That's not professional. And, um, <clears throat> and for me, the type of person that I am, um, it's just natural for me to want to go into healthcare because I always want to help people. So, um, so for her to tell me that, it just was against just like my basic values. But I understood it, this whole idea of professionalism. But to me, it, it became a barrier. So in my interaction with my partner, I feel like she kind of gave me permission to be a hugger. Like I, I feel like now I can ask my patient, is it, can I hug you? Is it okay? And it's not, um, it's not unprofessional because I feel like breaking down this wall of professionalism is what allows me to engender trust and us to trust each other so that we can talk about, you know, the anything. So, um, so that was the most impactful thing for me to just to be able to like temper this wall, like put cracks in it so that I could hug my patients when I needed to or touch them or, you know, and not it be seen as something like, you know, adverse or, you know, I know we live in a crazy world where, you know, there's all kinds of crazy things going. And so I understand this whole idea of professionalism and crossing these lines. But I feel like when it comes to empathy, you should be able to show like real emotion and caring. And so I feel like I got permission to do that in this program. I really wanted her to talk about her fears. <laughs> anyway, all right, all right, all right, all right. Um, I'm Alexis Kiner. Um, I was partnered with Shari Poindexter. Um, for me, uh, the, the fear that I had in interaction actually didn't come until later, after we had established a really lovely rapport, because Shari and I have something deep in common, which is... When you meet someone, you search immediately for the commonalities. Like, what are the commonalities in our life? And by ticking off those boxes, she and I both have this practice. And so we were able to communicate really easily right off the bat. And it wasn't until week six or seven where we were like, why did we get off to such a good start? What is it? And we were like, oh, we have all these things in common. But how do we know we have all those things in common is because we have this shared practice of this is where I'm from, this is where I'm from. Oh, have you been here? I've been here. Like, we narrowed it down very quickly about these are the contact points of our lives. And so my biggest fear came later into the program when we were getting much closer, um, which was doing something that I have a tendency to do, which is hide my pain. So if I'm in a situation where I care for someone or if I really don't care for them, you know, like there are many different opportunities for me to have this where I, but I was afraid that I was going to sort of hide, that I would hide and not be as honest with Shari as I had committed to being. And so that, I had to sort of acknowledge that fear. And there were a couple times, maybe in our last two conversations, where I had to say, wait, stop. I have to tell you this thing because this is, this will make the difference in you getting a fuller picture of what my experience is and what my, um, which is I am, um, my son died unexpectedly in 2012. And so my experience was, um, my daughter was four at the time, and so raising a child in a bereaved family and what that is and sort of the, the, the chronic condition that is and the different effects that happen in health 
when um, in bereavement. So it's kind of easy to hide behind um, smiles and it's fun. So that, that was something that I was confronted with. Thank you. Um, yeah, definitely echoing some of the themes that uh, Shari and Lexus, Lexus have shared. And Kim and I, we're, you know, on, on the outside, we're quite different, right? I'm Canadian. She's across the border. Um, I'm just figuring out, I'm, most of my life is consumed with school, right? And learning from um, different clinicians every day. And she has a whole family to take care of. And when Kim was my age, she was already diagnosed with her condition and she was trying to deal with the ramifications of that, right? And so um, it seemed like our lives were so different and we were so far apart, but um, immediately, even, even after the first time we chatted, um, we were able to figure out all of the shared values that we had deep down, right? A sense of curiosity, um, shared uh, empathy, um, a feeling of wanting to be connected. Um, for Kim, she really, felt like, you know, one of her biggest fears is she wanted to make sure that she was inspiring for her children and that she, importantly, she wanted to be inspiring for herself, right? And that's what kind of drove a lot of uh, her ability to overcome all of the hardships that she had. Um, and yeah, so yeah, a lot of similar themes shared and um, maybe the biggest theme that we kept on coming back to throughout all of our conversations was the theme of empathy. And, you know, it, I guess, you know, it could be seen as, oh, it's this airy topic. Everyone talks about empathy. We know empathy is important. Um, but when you tease out specific cases, you know, sometimes it's just, it cannot be ignored. And I, I feel like we still have so much work ahead of us for us to do. Um, I told her about a, a recent novel that I read uh, where the, the author went to Harvard Medical School and he was giving a talk on empathy and a second year Harvard medical student raised his hand and said, oh yeah, empathy, we, we had that talk. We learned that last, last week already. And he said, oh, okay, tell me more. What do you think is empathy? And the medical student um, Harvard replied, um, yeah, we learned that during interview week. Empathy is when you repeat the last three words that the patient says, and then you nod your head. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and combined with some of Kim's experience, it just shows how far that chasm is right? and how much like it's not even in their awareness um, of, of um, how much work there is left to do so um, it's been it's been the true honor and um, yeah okay um, so I, I echo what you said as well and um, starting uh, the program and going into it um, you know I guess one fear you have is, um, oh my goodness, what did I sign up for? <laughs> um, you know, you look at the weekly curriculum and kind of projecting outward, um, you know, what, what you're going to be working on. And, and really um, what it came down to is that it, it really wasn't work. Um, it became a, a friendship and a partnership very quickly. Uh, and it was kind of a natural progression over the six to eight week period that we Skyped. Um, what was nice about the journey was just um, being able, like I said this morning, to kind of he hear and see on Skype, really, which was helpful. I've actually never really Skyped prior to this. <laughs> uh, was really being able to see and hear, like, how, how difficult the journey of medical school really is. I mean, you hear all the time, you know, how difficult uh, medical school is. But when you're actually seeing somebody you know, getting four and five hours of sleep and still somehow waking up the next day to make rounds and then manage to jump on a nearly two-hour Skype with me to <laughs> go over some of the... Um, and we, and we, we, uh, we liked doing that, I hope so, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I have many doctor friends in the community just now that I have children and... Um, where we live, we have friends that are uh, doctors in the community, and and I, I don't, I didn't know them when they were in medical school. I know them now, and I know they work hard. Um, but being able to see her journey just these last six to eight weeks was a really good snapshot of uh, how much harder it really, really is. And um, oh, what else? I had something else I was gonna say. Well, I'll save it for later, but that was that was pretty much it. Maybe really briefly, just mm -hmm. before we take audience questions, just love to hear 
your experience with kind of like the curriculum and mm -hmm. how those conversations have affected the way that you think about um, the other side, the other perspective. Uh, the question is, um, excuse me. Um, there, I'm, I'm interested in hearing the panelists' opinion on the employee curriculum that they have and how that helps them um, really sort of understand the other side of like some of these questions. Oh. Uh, oh. I can, we can speak to that. So, okay, so we were all, um, all of us applied individually to the Emerging Leadership Program. So the concept of the program is that you sign on for a curriculum, like a commitment for an eight-week interaction between a patient and a caregiver, or, or not a caregiver, a patient and a provider. So that's anywhere within the medical sphere. So pharmacist, doctor of OT, um, physician. And so the idea by matching up a medical student or someone in the uh, healthcare sphere with a, someone in the patient sphere and through a very uh, targeted curriculum discussing various different things about healthcare experiences and, and the way healthcare can be in, improved, those um, by sort of hashing out that curriculum over the course of time, then um, you're, sort of, you're building these personal relationships, but it's also giving you an insight into the other. Um, and all, some of us also chose to work on a capstone um, idea which is, or a project which is like a big idea. And some of us are presenting later today on capstones, which are the big ideas. Shari and I are not presenting our capstone, but we had a great one. So, um, so come talk to us later, because it's a really good idea. Um, so, um, but that but that was the idea. And so that's, that anyone, did I? So, so it's so we all had shared Google Docs, and we did. So the the structure of it was we would have a conversation based on a weekly curriculum, and we have that conversation usually over video chat, which they really encouraged us to do, which I really loved because there's a pause that can happen when someone talks, and you can't really read it when you're talking on the phone. But it was so nice to be able to see Shari, and have her see me as we were chatting. I think it really enriched the the conversation. We took all of our notes and. And would even have conversations through a Google Doc. And then after each interaction, we were all asked to, to submit a video blog post of sort of our response to the week's curriculum. So did I miss anything, guys? Anything else? Mm -hmm. That was really good. Uh, maybe that was good. <laughs> Oh, we also had mentors for Capstone. Some of us had um, mentors that were more involved with others because we were, some of us were assigned mentors internationally. So, um, yeah, so, but that was really nice. And we had, oh, and for the patients, um, they had a weekly webinar. And so we, we um, would all sign in and there would be a guest speaker and a guest theme for every week. Um, and I found that completely super, super valuable. I wish there was something equivalent on the other jealous. side because Shari was very jealous. And it was also nice because I already had relationships with some of the patients. I knew your names before I got to meet you in person. So um, someone else want to talk about the curriculum? So, um, uh, the curriculum, I really, I really like the curriculum. It gave us such a good starting point and a good bouncing board. And we always, I think, you said we went really above and beyond the curriculum, and it was just the the curriculum. It sort of started with a really good way to to kind of just you said just tell tell them about you and you know who you are and where you come from, and um, from there it was we built up trust. And once we had that trust, then we just it kept going. Um, you know, to the point where it's it's like. Through this whole thing, you know, we became friends, and <laughs> during this 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 partnership, um, then the question I think it was maybe it was week four. It said it was going deeper. You know, we were able to dive deeper into these issues. Um, you know, and to talk about as I think as patients, there are some pretty vulnerable moments um, that you have experienced, um, and you know, talking about some of the really the really bad hospital experiences that I've had at the times that. You know, you went into appointments, and you know, when I was getting diagnosed, there was a time I was undiagnosed for four years, um, and there were some, definitely some appointments there where a doctor said, you know, no, it's all in your head. I'm sure, every patient's gotten that at some point, and that can be some of the most demoralizing feelings. Um, and so, I think to be able to talk about it on such a frank level, you know, once we built up that trust, um, it was 
so I was able to say, you know what, okay, here, let me tell you sort of the real raw moments um, that don't always get shared. And I think um, from a healthcare perspective, it's really interesting because then we're also talking about how to prevent that and how to make it so that the next generation of, of patients don't have those moments that just break down your soul. Do you want to go? Um, just to add on to that, um, when when I was first introduced to Jasmine, I learned that she had Parkinson's disease. Like you know, this was before we had started talking, and so I had, based on my curriculum, a textbook definition of Parkinson's. You've got a 65, 70 year old man who, you know, has a shuffling gait and all this. And then I meet 23-year-old Jasmine, and I'm like, okay, so this has already been completely flipped around. Um, and I think just speaking to the curriculum itself, uh, I completely agree with what Jasmine said. It really opened us up and let us develop trust. But um, I also found that, especially into the later weeks, we ended up just talking more than we talked about the curriculum. We, we had built a friendship. And I think that's something that's really cool to strive for even in a practice setting. So um, I, I really appreciate that opportunity and I'm definitely gonna you know, try and, and perpetuate that, so. Um, so I was just gonna say that one of the things that <clears throat> um, Alexis and I talked about was the, it was, it was something that was presented to us in the curricula about increasing um, increasing diversity in clinical trials. So things like that like got us really, really talking and, and actually that's kind of how our um, capstone project evolved. So just like things like that that we would never think about. Like we, it was, they were good prompts because we thought about things and we really delved in and explored those things very deeply and had very rich conversations about those things. So I, th I think the curricula was really good. It was a starting point, but it also was more than that because it, it allowed us to really like dig deep. <clears throat> And I want to thank the you know, Shari was so great and had what she called an open ear. Um, and that open ear allowed me to be like, okay, well, let's talk about this. Let's talk about Tuskegee. Let's talk about like, what are you seeing in your community as far as like race and reporting and what's happening? Like, what are you seeing? And it's really interesting because her children go to a school where my friends teach which is a very fancy school on the other side of the hill, and my child goes to a school that's 40% African American. So this was a really interesting thing to see like, okay, in the black community that I interact with every day with my, with my child's friends and my child's friends, these are the things that I'm seeing. These are the healthcare challenges that I'm seeing with them. What is it like to be an African American woman, to be a black woman who is of substantial height and excellent uh, fashion, I might say? Like, what is it like to like? What are the challenges that you have walking into the room? Like, what it what is that like on your side to be like? Because she like when she's dealing with patients, just like when I'm dealing with my clients, people sometimes say horrible things, and they can they have preconceived notions about who I am and what my experience is, is and has a lot of opinions about when I should get over being myself. And so it was really interesting to have her open up to me candidly about, so I don't know for sure, but this is something I see. And me being like, oh yeah, that to I could see how that is happening. And so to have those conversations, like to talk about diversity in healthcare and the importance of representation in healthcare teams when you're dealing with minority populations. We talked a lot about, um, I'm originally from Alaska, so the um, native people and my cousins are Athabascan, and so the native peoples and native problems are really, really near and dear to my heart. So we were able to talk, like really get into the nitty gritty about comparing sort of black American populations with native American populations and what can, what can be done to access these two populations that have had this really hard time. This is not the conversation she also was expecting to have with a woman who happens to be a hairdresser. <laughs> and that's something I get a lot because I work as a hairdresser. People have certain expectations about what they do and what hairdressers are and who they are and why they go into doing the thing they do. And so to just have that, she said something so cute. She oh said, this is so great. She was reading my bio. She goes, this is after a chat. She goes, what? She's a hairdresser, but she's so smart. Oh. And it's like, yeah. And so that's an important thing for medical professionals to realize that people are more than their jobs. So when your patients come in, know that they're more than their jobs and more than their whatever. So anyway, here. That's long-winded. Sorry. <laughs>
I think. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I think as a whole, this program is really good at breaking down social constructs, right? Like, what are some of your norms of behavior in your role, right? And, and as, even when I'm being trained, it's like, no, 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 you, like, you don't personally share with the patient. This is about the patient's care, not about your care or your problems, right? Um, but like, being able to see someone else, uh, get to know someone deeply, get to know the experience outside of a traditional professional clinical encounter. Um, it's such an authentic experience of something so much broader, right? Like you see them in their day-to-day -day lives. You see them in moments where um, that are extraordinarily ordinary, right? But this is them in, in, in like day-to-day -day when they're not in the clinic, when they're not in that specific encounter. Um, and you see them in some really hard points too, or you see them in points where they wouldn't quite bring it up with a healthcare professional when they're in the middle of an encounter, but it's the disappointments afterwards or the regrets afterwards or the frustrations afterwards that usually they never have the chance to vocalize to the healthcare professionals um, that, yeah, you, you really have that insight on authenticity too. So I love the breaking down of social constructs, um, learning outside of your usual spheres, um, and I also liked that the program, it was it was pretty audacious, right? Because it, you know, it, it asked some pretty deep questions, right? Right on the right on the get go, in the first encounters, it's like, okay, you just met this person. Now tell them what your deepest fear is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, tell them tell them what you're afraid others might see in you. Um, and you know, what do you what do you hope for fu for the future? And then as it becomes getting into the to the you know the middle of the program by weeks three or four, now it's like. You know, what are the problems in healthcare that you think are, you know, are the most important, are the most prevalent that need to be solved? How do you solve these issues, right? And on some sense, it can be quite daunting. You're like, oh my God, this is so overwhelming, right? That we're a student and a patient, and how are we supposed to solve the healthcare, create the healthcare of tomorrow? Um, but the program really makes it so that you're not afraid to try. Um, yeah, I think that's the key. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, how can I follow that? <laughs> Um, no, I, I think that the um, curriculum was fantastic. I mean, in the beginning, just asking those base, basic questions, you know, who are you, where do you come from, and by the way, what are your greatest fears? Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting, too, because we kind of um, process some of those fears and ambitions th throughout the entire curriculum. Is this kind of echoing a little bit? No, it's just because I'm hearing myself. Um, so we, I liked how the curriculum kind of took those first key questions and then kind of closed with them again in the end. So it kind of made it so that our discussions throughout the week or throughout the weeks. Um, kind of collectively um, came together as a full circle. And we even touched on a few fears and life's ambitions that we were almost uh, gun shy to talk about, I think, in the very beginning with that initial meet and greet discussion. So that was kind of neat too. And um, yeah, yeah, before I take my- We finished in a really different place. Yeah. 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 Question? Oh, the question is, can we say where we're all from? Sure. Um, I'm from here. I live in Portola Valley, about 12 minutes away. I'm from Canada. Um, I live in Vancouver, BC. Uh, I live in Los Angeles. I'm originally from Alaska. I live in Los Angeles. I'm originally from Connecticut. I live in Los Angeles, and I'm from there, too. <laughs> I don't live in Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, I'll go ahead and start off. Um, I'm. I also talked to Jasmine about this throughout the curriculum, but I'm really proud to say that my school has. Uh, embrace a lot of what we talked about, about going forward, about having the patient at the center, um, and about changing the way we view healthcare. And so absolutely, I think this is uh, super beneficial. I think that 
it should be included in some capacity. Um, and I think going forward, we, we have a lasting friendship. We're going to be able to talk to each other. Um, and, and I know the same is said for everyone else here. So um, with, with that, yeah, I, I think it's super important, and I definitely can see it being in the curriculum. So um, as an occupational therapist, um, putting the patient first is the core of what we do. So um, there's certainly always space to hear from the patient because there's so much that we learn from the patient, which is why we do lots of needs assessments. But I think a, a program like this, I think every school could use a program like this, especially if you're training health care clinicians, because that perspective is something that we just assume and you don't get it unless you're actually speaking to the actual patient so um, yeah definitely I think um, medical school at least in the in the beginnings of medical school there's a big focus on learning the science of medicine right like how do you go through medicine without the knowledge um, so it's all the ologies right it's the biologies the physiologies the pharmacologies the histologies the radiologies and we don't, we don't have as many encounters like this. We had one, one session, one two or three hour session in the beginning of first year medical school where we, we had the chance to be paired with a chronic disease patient. And it was like one, one snippet, one, one interview um, to get to know their lives a little bit uh, beyond our usual encounters. But it's certainly not embedded in our curriculum. When students do take up opportunities like this, it's usually elective. Um, so there are opportunities on the side. But the interesting thing is it's a selection bias, right? Like the people that are naturally gravitating towards programs like this, they already care about empathy. That's why they're curious to learn more. Um, you know, the students that think they already know empathy based off interviewing skills, those aren't, <laughs> those aren't the students that would elect for this. And so I, I think we could definitely benefit with a curriculum that um, is for, can engage everyone. I think, and I think as the patients, um, I think one of the things that patients who have the ability and the privilege to be able to speak out and to make, um, you know, their voices heard, I think it's it's kind of a, a duty to to talk. Um, and I think that one of the things that patients need to push for is for these programs, because patients need to push for changes in the medical education that serves them, um, and. If you think about making these changes in the medical education that exists already, the doctors who went through it already don't have that. I think that's that's a great a great point about um, you know educating in the um, the doctors and having this this program to to, to regain that empathy. Um, you know, we talked about compassion fatigue was one of the things, and you know, I it's hard for me as a patient to understand how a doctor could go into a room and see these life stories. Um, and also to not understand the power that doctors have over our lives. Um, the five minutes, the 10 minutes that we spend in a doctor's office could be the difference between being able to thrive and reach the potential that you're given or not having the tools that you need and not being able to have success because you don't have the tools. Um, I don't think doctors realize the power that they hold over our lives um, and just how stressful and anxious that can make us. Um, and so I think that patients need to push for programs like these in, in, in medical schools and in trainings because if we don't, th that, that voice is not heard um, and it's not expressed and it's not passed on to the next generation. Quickly, I think that it is one of the things that I liked about working with a student um, is um, it's kind of like that, uh, the campaign from the 70s to save water where everyone had to turn the water off when they brushed their teeth because people used to let the water run the whole time they brushed their teeth. And so you got the children to turn the water off while they brushed their teeth and it saved like billions of gallons of water. I think that by working with students who are still in their education, regardless of sort of where their age is, by working with students, it becomes an integral part of their medical practice and so I think that it is important, and while it would be really great to have sort of the like re-education of mid-career physicians, um, that, you, that that patient group would, ha would need to like, it, it's tough, as a patient, it's, it's kind of a tough, um, it's a very rigorous eight weeks. So it was very nice to have 
um, a new and empathetic ear. Mm -hmm. Here, I think, um, I'll, um, can we, Kevin, can we, can Kevin and I just finish? Oh, sure, make sure. A, I think that's a great, it's such an interesting comment because um, in a sense, right, like my, my class and our generation, we're the most diverse uh, trainees ever, right? If you just rewind it 30 years back, the typical medical student would look very different. Um, I have every culture in my class uh, represented under the sun. <laughs> um, and naturally, in our, in our curriculum, it's already evolving, right? Like we, we, we speak about always making sure that, you know, you, you hear the patient out. And sometimes the medical issue might not be their biggest issue, right? Um, and so, uh, so how do you, how do you, how, you, you know, you, you're kind of dealing with uh, the most open-minded generation when you're talking to, talking about um, teaching medical students empathy. So what about the, uh, the previous generations? Kim, did you want to talk a little? We spoke about this. We did. Yeah. We did. Uh, I think um, it, it's a great idea in theory. I think that dealing with mid to late career physicians as specialists, in my experience, um, I don't see the paradigm shifting very much. I think that um, grasping the the young, fresh blood, <laughs> and and the, I mean they're young and ambitious and driven to to want to help and to create change. I think those are the ones that really um, really changing kind of the the shift uh, or the generational change in. Uh, Healthcare, I think that will that's going to be most beneficial. Um, but we also talked about how it's not like it's not hopeless, right? I think medical medical students, residents, we're sent, like we're 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 in the phase of learning, right? We don't know what medicine is meant to be like, and so we're the most malleable and the most open to new ideas. And usually, physicians who are a few years into their practice, they you know the, it's it's quite no noticeable that they they typically. Do, practice the way they've been taught during their curriculum, and they stick to their boundaries of comfort because that's what's worked for them, right? Um, but, um, you know, there's been some studies with virtual reality where they would just approach everyday American citizens on the streets, and they would put a, you know, a three-minute VR video onto them um, showing footage from someone walking through a Syrian refugee camp. And what they found after, and it's VR, it's so engaging, right? Because you're looking around, it's pretty immersive. You feel like you're in the environment. You turn around and there's someone standing behind you. So you feel like you're physically brought out of your the street and into a Syrian refugee camp. And that three-minute immersive experience increased the empathy levels of an everyday um, person. And so we were thinking, what if we had something like that for doctors, yeah. right? That they, they can take them out of their usual day-to-day -day practice um, and into an experience that they wouldn't otherwise um, have. But I think the key is if we are to re-educate doctors, it needs to be very, it needs to be quick, it needs to be, right? Because they're so time poor. And um, so if it's if it's like a three minute, five minute video, if it's something that could be shown, you know, a, you know, for half an hour, once every two weeks, or half an hour, once every month, I think that's totally doable. Um, our capstone project that we, that we were proposing was to get the doctors out of the office and into the community. So in, you know, just addressing your comment, um, I think it would have to be something like that, like the three minute thing or something like this probably won't work for what one of my professors, when she was training us calls the oldie moldies. She's like, the only moldies are set in their ways. They don't even look at evidence anymore. They just do, you know, what they've always been doing, which also, you know, speaks to what I think Dr. Pearl was talking about yesterday about the doctors just doing these surgeries, even though they know that they're not effective, but that's what they're going to do because that's what they've been doing. So our capstone project is about getting them out of the the office and into the community and maybe like having dinner with a family so you can engender empathy and get to know these people as human beings and this is how what you're going to propose as a doctor is going to affect their lives directly so that they can just, you know, be more empathetic. Do you have a question back there? I know where it's at. No, there's two questions back there I can see, yeah. <laughs> You from the webinar. I remember you. <laughs> I've never met you in person. Hi. <laughs> and that's the bravery of the, the physician taking off the lab coat and just being a human for a minute. And that sort of, that is, that's, I mean, for our family, that's 
what saved the health of our family was the the ped throwing off her lab coat stopping everything she was doing that day and just being there for us one more question over here um thanks and thanks for taking over this challenge i think it's fantastic and i hope that what you have learned will be um, applied to improve healthcare and redesigning and reimagining healthcare. I think on the positive note, I wanted to share that um, there are hospitals that have recognized the need to teach empathy to their doctors. And for instance, Mass General Hospital, MGH in Boston, has a program that is actually a six month program for physicians to learn empathy. Um, the company that um, that uh, is providing the training is founded by um, a physician a psychiatrist that also works at Mass General, and it's called Empathetics. So if you guys want to take a look at it, um, it's happening. It's happening, and I think it's happening because of the feedback of people like you and the Medicine X community that have um, pushed for this to happen. Thanks. That's great. Um, great. I, I, thank you, everyone, for coming and for listening. And thank you to everyone on the panel and out in the audience.